quandary. So for those of you who uh, come to these talks often, you might be wondering who I am. Uh, my name is Garrett, hello. Uh, I, me, myself, along with Nicole, have uh, taken over the organization for these public talks. Um, and so that's just to let everybody know about that. Um, uh, today we have three very talented professors from the Department of Physics here at McGill. Uh, they are Kartik Agarwal, uh, Lily Childress, and Bill Koish. And so how this panel is uh, going to work is we have three leading questions that we're going to pose to our panelists. Um, while they're answer, uh, answering these questions, we're hoping that you are going to come up with your own questions uh, that you could type into the chat on Zoom or YouTube or you could leave them in the YouTube comments. And these questions eventually will be uh, given to me and then the, I will pose them to our panelists. Um, so of course, these uh, questions are only gonna come after the uh, panelists have answered our leading questions and then have talked about their research uh, at the beginning. So, um, and Nicole will be handling those questions behind the scenes, feeding them to me. Uh, I'll remind everybody that this panel is supposed to go until 8.30. And without further ado, we might as well get to it. Uh, and so the first question that we have is posed to Bill Koish, and it is maybe the naively simple question, what is uh, quantum information? Okay, thanks, Garrett. I'll see if I can share my screen. Uh, there it is. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. Yeah, so uh, this is a tough question to answer in just five minutes, but I'll do my very best to do a quick crash course. Uh, my favorite analogy to quantum mechanics or quantum information concepts comes from Charlie Bennett from IBM. And he says quantum mechanics is like a dream. Uh, so if you have some story that's written down in a book that's like some classical information, anyone can pick up that book and read it. Uh, and understand the story and the story was written down before you read it and it doesn't change because you read it but if you have a dream and you wake up and uh, that dream is still floating around in your head it feels much more mutable it hasn't really solidified and it doesn't really solidify until you tell someone about that dream where you write it down uh, so quantum mechanics is very much like that um, it's much less mutable, or it's much more mutable, much less solid, uh, until you actually do a measurement or concretely uh, analyze some quantum system. Um, now, what is information in the first place? So the basic element of information that we know of is the bit. Uh, it's just uh, an answer to a binary question, yes or no, one or zero. Uh, you can think of a macroscopic object being in one of two states. Uh, light switch is off, it's zero. It's on, it's one. A qubit or quantum bit is the same sort of object. Uh, it's some small quantum mechanical system that can be in one of two states. Uh, zero, which is represented by this funny symbol here, uh, might correspond to the ground state of a quantum atom. Uh, and a one might correspond to the excited state of that same atom. Uh, and how do you quantify the amount of information you can put into some system that's like this classical system or like this quantum system? Well, you can count the number of messages that you can send with a collection of these systems. So if you have only one bit, uh, you can only answer a binary question, one yes, no question, uh, zero or one. Uh, and so there are two possible messages you can send, either yes or no, one or zero. Uh, if you have two bits, then you can send four possible messages corresponding to these four collections of ones and zeros. Uh, and so on, all the way up to n. So if you have n bits, you can send two to the power of n different possible messages, different strings of zeros and ones. Um, and because this grows exponentially with that little n, uh, we often quantify the information by that little n, the number of bits that we use to store. So if I have some number of messages omega that I can send with a some system, then I, I have an information associated with that system that is the logarithm base two of that number of messages. Uh, now, if I reduce my ability to send messages by enforcing a constraint, like I say, I want to have uh, one sent with a particular probability uh, 1 minus p and zero sent with a probability 
uh, P, uh, then I reduce the number of messages that I can have and I reduce the information content. And the measure that we use for that is called Shannon entropy. You don't have to worry too much about the math here, but there's this function H2 of P uh, that characterizes the number of messages that you can send, given that you have some kind of prior constraints some probability of sending a one or a zero. Uh, so this is this fancy formula for this thing called Shannon entropy that quantifies information. And the thing to know about that is that you get the most information, the most possible messages when you have the most random possible state. So when this probability P of sending a one or zero is one half, so we don't know whether we have a one or a zero coming next, uh, we get the most possible information, the largest number of messages that can be sent. Uh, and if you force yourself to choose always one or always zero, then you have no information. You can not really send any useful information because you'd only know that you're getting a string of ones or a string of zeros. Um, so this concept that we have here uh, of adjusting the amount of information that we have depending on the probability of sending a one or a zero uh, is an example of classical randomness. Okay, uh, This is an example of a statistical mixture. So where we have some prior knowledge of some random outcome, a one or a zero. Uh, and this is all classical. So this is classical information theory, what I've been telling you so far. A quantum system is a little bit different in the sense that instead of just a classical mixture, we have another thing called a superposition. So what is a quantum superposition? So as I said, you could, if you wanted to, just use quantum bits, qubits, uh, as bits, ascend zero with probability p or one with probability one minus p. But in addition, we have this thing called superposition in quantum mechanics, and it's really required to understand quantum systems. A superposition can be understood if we map this quantum bit onto a two component vector, a one zero for a zero or a zero one for a one. And then we say a superposition is a linear combination. It's a sum of each of these two component vectors weighted by some complex coefficient alpha and beta. And in order to have a probabilistic interpretation for these coefficients, we need that they satisfy this formula. Now, the numbers that can satisfy this formula for complex alpha and beta can really just be taken to be a cosine and a sine times some arbitrary phase. And we can represent that state, that what we call a quantum mechanical pure state, uh, as a point on the surface of a sphere because the cosine uh, and sine can be represented in terms of this angle theta, uh, the, sorry, the uh, azimuthal and polar angles theta and phi. Um, so a pure state is distinct from a mixture in the sense that we know the coefficients alpha and beta. So we know that quantum state. It's some, somehow deterministic, but in another sense, it's non-deterministic because when we do measurements, the outcomes are probabilistic depending on how we do that measurement. Uh, whereas with a mixture, the outcomes are always probabilistic. Um, and so this, this superposition concept extends beyond just single qubits to many qubit states and it underlies what's really really interesting about quantum information okay so this concept that you've heard of probably called entanglement uh is uh is essentially the superposition principle applied to many qubit states uh so the notion is that if i have a state that is not just for one qubit but for many qubits there are many 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 of those there's an exponentially large number of those remember uh, and so i in order to describe an arbitrary pure quantum state of this many qubit system, I have an exponentially large number of complex amplitudes that I would need in superposition. So how would I describe such a quantum state? Well, I could think about describing it in storage, just keep it in my RAM or in my hard drive, keep all the values of these complex numbers. Um, and I just looked up before this talk what the total global storage is estimated in all data centers around the world right now. And the estimate right now is roughly 2000 exabytes. An exabyte is a billion gigabytes. So that's about 10 to the 21 bytes. And if we say it takes about one byte per complex coefficient, uh, that means that we, we could store this state for up to 70 qubits using all of the storage and all of the data centers in all of the world. So for just 70 qubits, if you want to store that quantum mechanical state and get an abstract description of it, you would need all of the storage that we have in all of the world. But you know, if you could take hold of that and create it, if you could create such a state in some other physical system in 70 of these two level systems, uh, then you can imagine doing things that just would be completely inconceivable with all of the storage that you have in the world right now.
Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that people are doing, for instance, at IBM, where they have now a 127-bit quantum processor that they can manipulate. Um, so we're at that point where we're at a stage where you cannot possibly simulate these quantum systems with any classical system. Uh, and so, it, you know, quantum mechanics is a dream in more than one sense. It's a dream in the sense that it's ambiguous until you measure it, but it's also a dream in the sense that there's this dream that we can do things that we never could before. So thanks. All right, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, that was very interesting. So uh, next, our next question uh, is going to be to Kartik Agarwal, and that is, what can quantum information be used for? Yeah, thanks, Garrett. That's a that's a great question. Um, so first, let me just say that you know this is at the present moment a very active area of research. So as we are building quantum computers, at the very same time, we're also trying to understand what this quantum computers. Um, are good for what we can use this quantum information for. Um, and so I'd like to maybe rephrase this question just a little bit, if you'd allow me to, and uh, put it instead as where are we sure that quantum computers have a distinct advantage over classical computers? Okay. And the reason I put it in this way is because ultimately, you know, any computation that you actually would want to perform whether it's to predict weather patterns or to maybe calculate interest on your investment, um, you can, in principle, uh, using your classical digital computer working on a string of zeros and ones, uh, perform this computation. The main question is, well, how much resources do you actually need for the classical computer to actually execute this task as opposed to a quantum computer. So that's where, in some sense, uh, is the question that we need to determine what are these uh, quantum computers better at doing than the class of computers? And this resource, by the way, I mean anything. Um, how much memory uh, does it need to uh, solve a particular task? Uh, you know, storage, gigabytes. How much time does it take to solve a particular task, et cetera? Okay. So, to make this question precise, uh, we can go to computer scientists who have come up with the notion of complexity theory. Um, and uh, there, there is a very simple uh, and very beautiful idea that you, know, you can classify problems depending on their hardness. Okay, So there is a certain set of problems uh, that you can solve in what is called polynomial time, whereas there are a certain set of problems that require an exponential amount of time to solve. Um, so to just give an example, suppose you have n numbers to sort in an ascending order. You know, one algorithm you can think of is you take all those numbers and you go through them one by one, and you keep arranging them in a new list. Okay, uh, and as you do that, um, you know, every time you find a new number, you you find where you should put it in this new list that is uh, sorted. And overall, if you compute, uh, you know, this algorithm will take order n square computations. Okay, so where n was the initial number set of numbers that you were given. So this is a polynomially difficult task and our classical computers for the most part are pretty good at working with these tasks. The question where you know quantum computers could really become important is when it comes to exponential tasks. So let me give you an example of a task that takes order e to the n. So uh, Prime uh, uh, factorization of integers is a problem um, that has been you know, studied for a long time. And we know that if you want to factorize a number of n digits, um, for a classical computer to do this, uh, for sure, it'll take a time order exponential in n. And so that's, you know, just to give an idea of how bad that is, suppose it takes um, one hour for a classical computer to factorize a 10 digit, 10 digit number, then to factorize a 20 digit number, it would take uh, about 10 years and it just you know, explodes really fast, right? And so uh, in 1994, Shore came up with this algorithm where he showed that in fact, if you take a quantum computer, a quantum computer could actually factorize a very large number in actually just polynomial amount of time. So that was really something 
that shocked uh, everyone that really, you know, brought a lot of attention to quantum computing as a possibility of solving really, really hard problems. And, you know, just to uh, make it clear, you might think, okay, what is, you know, factorizing such a large number got to do with, uh, you know, anything that's interesting? Well, this, just the fact that this is so hard is used as a encryption scheme in all our, you know, uh, software uh, today, uh, especially financial stuff. Um, so, so therefore, this is an example where we know, for instance, that quantum computers can beat classical computers. And there is a hope that if we build a powerful enough quantum computer, it could solve such problems much faster. It could completely change how we do encryption. Now, that said, perhaps the most immediate um, place where quantum information uh, could be used and where quantum computers could be used um, is in just simulating quantum systems themselves. And this is also a very important task because if you think about it, if you wanna ask how does my drug and the molecule in this drug affect biological matter? Well, the molecules are made of atoms. They're fundamentally governed by quantum mechanics. And this is an extremely hard problem because in fact, all quantum mechanical problems scale exponentially with the constituent particles, atoms, what have you. Um, so as a result, uh, you know, it's, it's natural to imagine that uh, quantum computers will be particularly adept at uh, simulating quantum systems because they're governed by the same laws. And I think this is probably the avenue where we will make the most progress in the near future, whether it's for the simulation of quantum materials or for simulation of molecules for medicinal research. I think that's basically where uh, you could imagine quantum information being put to use in the near future. All right, thank you. That was a fascinating take on the question. Um, and now we're on to our third question, uh, which is to Lily, and it is what physical systems can be used in quantum computers? Great, thank you. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen, see if this uh, works. And do you all see my slides? Good. Great, yeah. uh, so hello everyone. Um, apologies in advance for the screaming children in the background. Um, and I've been asked to say a few words about what physical systems can encode quantum information. Um, and I have to say that's a, a pretty daunting task, but I'll do my best. Um, so maybe I can start by giving you an idea of what's important in these physical systems. So first, we want to identify a physical system that has two possible states, those are going to be our qubit states, that are as isolated as possible from their environment. This ensures that noise from their surroundings won't affect or measure the quantum states, which would have the impact of making them start to act classically instead of quantum mechanically. This kind of pure quantum behavior is termed coherent um, because it evolves purely according to quantum mechanics without getting tripped up by outside noise. So the next requirement is obvious, but also a bit of a contradiction. We want a system that on the one hand is totally isolated from everything, but we still wanna be able to control it. We wanna be able to prepare and measure its states and to be able to perform logical gates between different quantum bits, um, which essentially amounts to being able to make them interact with each other, but of course, only when we want them to. And then finally, we need to come up with a physical platform where we can think about going from one or two or three quantum bits to hundreds, thousands, or millions of them. So to give you an idea about how these requirements play out, let's, let's consider an early platform that was being researched about two decades ago, uh, nuclear spins and molecules. So this is, I honestly don't know what this molecule is, but uh, it's a molecule that has a bunch of atoms that have nuclear spins. Here I've put arrows on the ones that have nuclear spins. And if you don't know what I mean by a spin, you can think of that as like a tiny bar magnet associated with the nuclei of these atoms. <clears throat> um, and so these, these tiny, tiny bar magnets obey uh, quantum mechanics, which ultimately forces them to take on one of two possible states that we call spin up or spin down. And you can encode information in this. Uh, these would be your qubit states zero and one, like what Bill was talking about. So the reason that people were interested in working with nuclear spins and molecules is that they can be amazingly well isolated from their environment. Um, and, and so they were proposed as, as qubits. And I should say this, this diagram is kind of a funny way of illustrating an algorithm. Um, 
actually Shor's algorithm that uh, Kartik was uh, alluding to, which is, I think, in this case, factoring the number of 15 using seven of these nuclear spins, which are represented by these lines here. And the gates, the logical gates between them are represented using these funny symbols. But regardless, um, the way that this would actually be done in practice is that you would need to be able to uh, prepare and measure your states. And in the case of nuclear spins, you can measure them by detecting the tiny magnetic fields that these tiny little bar magnets uh, are producing. Um, and they can be controlled by applying magnetic fields to them. And they interact with each other in much the same way that one bar magnet pulls on another, making it possible to implement logical gates. However, with these, these nuclei and molecules, there wasn't a good way to prepare them in a well-defined state. And while you can think about having molecules with a handful, maybe a couple of dozen spins, you can't keep scaling this up indefinitely. So today, actually, there are leading qubit platforms that are also based on spins, but typically they're accessed in different ways. Um, for example, by ionizing individual atoms, that is ripping off or adding an electron so that they have a charge, typically ripping off an electron in practice, um, you, can, you can then make them charged, which allows you to electrostatically trap them. This is a Paul trap that has a bunch of ions trapped in there. And the spins associated with, with those ions can be accessed optically using lasers. Um, while the charge, well, that sort of leads them to push on each other such that if one moves, the other moves, and you get a vibrational coupling between them that allows you to implement logical gates. Scaling the system up is also challenging, but you can think about shuttling these ions around to different regions of a chip or potentially sending optical signals between them to engineer lar large range interactions. This is not the only type of spin-like spin qubits that are currently being pursued. Um, near and dear to Bill's heart are uh, spins associated with quantum dots. So these are spins of individual electrons that have been trapped in semiconductor nanostructures known as quantum dots. This is this here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. This is a picture of a semiconductor. Uh, that's the dark gray with metallic structures in light gray deposited on top of it. And by applying a negative charge to this metallic structure, you can define small regions in the semiconductors where, well, the, the negative charge kind of pushes on the electrons and pushes them into little regions where they can exist um, that are the, the so-called quantum dots. And by applying different voltages to these metallic contacts, you can prepare and manipulate the electron spins while sending currents through the device can make it possible to detect the spin states. And there's even more ways. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about this later. One of the one of the spin type qubits that I work with are associated with defects in crystalline solids. But if you've been following quantum computing popular literature, you've probably also heard a lot about a very different type of platform, superconducting qubits. It's a bit challenging to explain this in a few minutes, but let's let's say that superconduct superconductivity is pretty special. When you cool down certain materials, uh, many metals, for example, um, the electrons in them can pair up. And when they pair up, they behave very differently. They can condense into a macroscopic quantum state with remarkable properties, able to, for example, sustain currents with no resistance. Here's a silly analogy. Electrons in a normal metal are like people milling about in a crowd. When you cool them down, the music starts, they pair up, and they all start to waltz in a well-defined, persistent pattern. Okay, maybe it's not the best analogy, but anyway, this superconducting state opens a wealth of possibilities for qubits. Um, to give you a taste of some of these possibilities, maybe the simplest superconducting qubit to understand is the Cooper pair box. Cooper, I should say, is the scientist who first described electron pairing. So this, these electron pairs are called Cooper pairs. And this tiny blue bar uh, is the Cooper pair box. It's a, it's a piece of superconductor, and the qubit states are defined by whether or not an extra Cooper pair has slipped onto the bar or not. And it can slip in a very coherent way because of this, uh, this uh, quantum coherent state. A slightly more sophisticated superconducting qubit is the flux qubit. Um, where's my, cute, my cursor? Okay, this is the, an image of a ring of superconducting material. It's a little tricky to see, but essentially supercurrents can flow around this ring in one direction or the other. And those two directionalities of current flow, again, give you qubit states uh, such that you can encode information into it. 
And really, there's a huge number of superconducting qubit types. And frankly, I would not be able to explain all of them, if, even if you asked me. Um, but they share the very low dissipation associated with the superconducting state of electrons. And they can be controlled with applied electromagnetic fields. Furthermore, they can interact with each other directly. Um, for example, this uh, flux qubit, you can imagine if you've got a current going around in it, that current's going to generate a magnetic field that would interact with another superconducting loop nearby. So they can interact with each other either directly or via a kind of, well, it's known as a quantum bus, a, a superconducting resonator that can mediate interactions between superconducting qubits that are even millimeters apart. Um, and the systematic fabricate, nanofabrication of these types of, of systems really does make it very scalable. And already we're hearing about devices such as the one that Bill mentioned from IBM that are in this 100 qubit uh, direction. Now, so far, all the different platforms I've talked about have been material systems, things you could hold in your hand, or at least in your ultra cold dilution refrigerator, um, but they aren't terribly well suited to sending quantum information over long distances. For that, photons, the quantized units of electromagnetic energy, those are the clear solution. Uh, so what is a photon? Well, you can think of it as a tiny pulse of light, the smallest possible chunk, and there's lots of ways to encode information into it. For example, you could use the polarization state of light. Um, light is an electromagnetic wave where the electric field oscillates back and forth as it propagates. There's also a magnetic field, but let's focus on the electric field. Um, and the direction in which the electric field is oscillating is the polarization state of the light. So in this example, it would be horizontally polarized or H polarized in the lingo. Um, I don't have a nice picture of it, but if you imagine rotating this image by 90 degrees, you'd have a light wave where the electric field was oscillating vertically or V polarized. And these two different polarization states of light are orthogonal and they can encode information much as the, the two states of a spin. But this is just one of many choices. You could encode information in the time of arrival of a photon, in the path that it takes, its frequency, its spatial mode. Um, the, the number of, of choices really is, uh, is quite large. Um, and for photons, there's, there's something more I should mention, though, because although photons are extremely well isolated and they can propagate for hundreds of kilometers without decohering, they don't like to interact with each other. And so it's very challenging to implement logical gates. Um, but there's some tricksy ways around this. Uh, and there's a lot of research into materials that can mediate interactions with photons. And so photons have also become a, a front runner for, for qubit uh, technologies. And although I'm way over my time, I haven't gotten to everything. There's many more. And I hope that this gives you just a, a little taste of some of the many systems that people are looking to implement quantum information in. All right, thank you so much, Lily. Um, and now we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna go back around and uh, just talk about each of these props research a little bit. Um, so I guess we could start again with Bill. Uh, sure, I'll just try to share my screen again. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot, Garrett. Um, so Lily already mentioned this type of qubit to you. Um, the type of qubit that my work, my group works on primarily uh, is a type defined in a single electron spin uh, in a quantum dot. So a quantum dot is, uh, you can think of it as like a little potential basket, kind of like uh, an artificial atom uh, that is actually much, much larger than one atom, uh, but it holds one electron. So the blue sphere is supposed to represent the state of a single electron. And each of the blue and red uh, smaller spheres represents an individual atom in a semiconductor material. If you have metallic gates on the surface of a semiconductor, then the metallic gates can be polarized with a voltage that allows you to confine a single electron. That electron has two possible states, spin up and spin down along an applied magnetic field, uh, but it uh, cannot be used for quantum information applications if those states can't live long enough. Uh, and the thing that hurts those states is the environment. So the environment here is represented by a bunch of little arrows. So there are little spins of nuclei uh, at all of these atomic sites. And for many years, uh, roughly, well, maybe about 20 years, uh, people have been studying these systems uh, for electrons in semiconductors, but there's another option uh, that uh, they only just started considering very recently. And this other option is to look at holes. 
holes are the absence of an electron in a semiconductor where you pull out a negative charge. If you pull out a negative charge, you're left with this positively charged mass that moves around kind of like a particle that has positive charge, a hole. It too has a spin and it too can represent a quantum bit and it has several advantages over electrons. So electron spin based uh, quantum computers have only reached the two qubit level. Uh, much less than the 127 qubit level. Uh, but we've been studying whole spin based quantum computers for a while. And in particular, a former PhD student of mine who is now working for nano academic, uh, um, nano academic technologies, which is a Montreal based company uh, doing similar work for, for quantum computing applications, uh, managed to get the wave functions uh, of the holes uh, in these semiconductor materials to a very high degree of accuracy, which allows us to determine the microscopic properties that will determine the lifetimes of those qubits. Uh, and we were lucky that our collaborators in Delft and the Netherlands uh, were then able to construct a four qubit processor uh, out of holes uh, in these semiconductor quantum dots. So this scale bar has a size on the order of 100 nanometers. Um, to put that into perspective, uh, that's uh, that's ten to the minus seven meters, or it's about uh, it's about uh, a few hundred atoms on a side. Um, so each of these individual arrows represents a single whole spin that can be manipulated and controlled as a qubit, uh, but it suffers from decoherence. So it suffers from a loss of its of its uh, information. And that information loss can be measured with a very well-defined procedure. So this group has done that measurement uh, and they sent us the data last summer and an undergraduate working uh, in my group over the summer managed to come up with a theory that very, very accurately explains the time dynamics of their qubits. Uh, so you can see that the theory in red and the blue experiment in blue match surprisingly well. Uh, I can tell you that this is actually quite a remarkable feat considering the very small number of uh, parameters we have and the fact that we can fit across a very broad range of experiments. It's not just uh, fit to each experiment independently. Okay, so that's uh, that's just one snapshot of a project that has been going on in my group, but there are many other people in the group and I, I really appreciate all of their projects. Uh, most, if not all of their projects have a relationship to quantum computing or quantum information in some way. I, I just apologize for the overexposure of uh, Victor's picture here. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And uh, then we'll go next to Kartik to talk about his research. Let me share my screen. Um, sorry, this takes a while, but hopefully it should appear. All right, can you see my screen? Great. Yeah, so, um, so thanks first of all, uh, again, for organizing this uh, panel and uh, uh, the invitation. So I just wanted to speak a little bit about um, uh, some of the, you know, Lily mentioned a, a whole bunch of different kinds of qubits, uh, but she did not mention one, which I think has uh, its own strengths and merits. And it's something that uh, my group has been interested in uh, of late. Uh, and this is the idea of topological qubits. And in particular, I'm talking about topological qubits uh, made of Majoranas. So in the five minutes that I was given, um, hopefully I can try to give you a sense of why these are interesting in their own way, um, rather than maybe giving you details of my own research. So, okay, we already answered this. Uh, why quantum computing? Uh, just briefly, there are some problems that quantum computers can solve. Uh, perhaps much, much faster than classical computers. And one of the reasons, as Bill uh, rightly pointed out, is that you know, as opposed to classical computers, which work on classical bits uh, that take values zero or one, um, quantum computers work on quantum bits, which um, can be at the same time in zero or one. So it's this fluid state between zero and one. Uh, and in some sense, uh, if you think of a quantum register of these qubits, then in principle, that register can be in a superposition of all possible bit strings that you can imagine. 
And the reason in some sense why computers can beat classical computers on certain tasks is because they're effectively parallelly processing all these bit strings at the same time, while a classical computer is just going through them one by one. Now, on the other hand, besides you know, of these advantages, there is also the obvious disadvantage, which uh, if you think of a classical bit, you know, to make, to give an error, you have to flip a zero to a one. That's a discrete change and it's hard to do. But if you think of a quantum bit, as Bill showed, there is a sphere, you can imagine the state of the quantum bit to point uh, to um, as, you know, it's a point on the surface of the sphere and you can have small errors that just change this needle on the sphere uh, a little bit, but over time they accrue and they, they become really hard to uh, correct um, and, or they, they lead to erroneous results. Uh, the other issue, which um, is also particularly uh, difficult um, in the quantum world, is that you cannot clone quantum information uh, because as soon as you measure it, uh, you essentially collapse the wave function, you destroy that information as it was in that state. So you cannot create copies of it and do some kind of majority vote that you would do in classical uh, uh, you know, data. So that's really why quantum uh, computing is, is so hard uh, because the qubits are really error prone objects and we have to work really hard to protect them from the environment. So, in come Majoranas. Um, so Majoranas are these interesting objects that um, happen to be their own antiparticles. So if you bring two Majoranas together, uh, they will annihilate. And this was uh, proposed by Ettore Majorana, an Italian physicist uh, who was trying to solve the Dirac equation, looking for massless solutions of fermions. You know, electrons are also described by the Dirac equation. Uh, but we don't really know if the particles he predicted exist in nature, but we do know that they can be found as particles in certain materials, uh, very, very specifically designed. So this is one such platform uh, to just illustrate on the bottom right, which Microsoft has uh, invested heavily into. So you have a, a you know, superconductor on which you place a semiconducting wire and you apply a magnetic field in a certain direction. And if you have everything just right, then what you find is that the semiconducting wire has two of these Majoranas, one on each end. And together, these two Majoranas, uh, oops, it's something, there was a problem. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, let me reopen my slide. Sorry about that. It's unfortunate. Uh, okay, we quit it. Okay, no worries. Sorry, can you see my screen again? Yes, we can do it. About that. Yes, so, so as I was saying, um, on the semiconducting wire on either end, you find the Majorana uh, fermion. And in particular, two of these Majoranas, they encode a qubit. Um, so what is the advantage of these Majoranas? Well, first of all, they store quantum information in a highly non-local way. So if you think about any kind of local uh, environmental fluctuations, uh, electromagnetic noise, they actually don't affect the state of the qubit or they affect it extremely weakly, okay? So what is the, the biggest advantage of these topological qubits is that they effectively uh, implement protection from errors at the hardware level, uh, which is you know, uh, remarkable. The other thing that's particularly cool is that Majoranas are non-abelian particles. And what this actually means is that if you manage to exchange two of these Majoranas, um, what it does is it implements a logical operation on your qubit. 
And this operation in particular is also implemented in a robust way that doesn't accrue errors. So for instance, if you exchange to Majoranas, uh, your qubit goes from uh, state zero to zero plus one um, uh, perfectly. So in other words, Majoranas are really the way to implement uh, error protection at the hardware level. And even though this technology is yet to go ahead, I think in the long run, this may become a, a very prominent part of our quantum computer. Um, so with all this said, you would be asking, you know, there are so many advantages. Well, where is my quantum computer? Why haven't we built it already yet out of these Majoranas and topological qubits? And indeed, uh, you know, for the past 10 years, uh, Microsoft has put a lot of money into this. Governments, industry partners, scientists have been working hard to make this, this work. And it's unfortunately, it's taken us 10 years to realize, but really the issue at the crux of it is that um, we're working with a setup uh, which has some intrinsic problems. So superconductivity uh, and magnetic fields just really don't work very well together. If you have large magnetic fields, they kill superconductivity. And that balance to act uh, actually make good Majorana qubits, it turns out to be extremely hard uh, as a material um, you know, uh, engineering problem. So what we have to do and what we are thinking of in my group are ways of imagining different kinds of setups where we can realize maybe not just Majoranas, but other uh, topological excitations that have different properties and that could be used to perform quantum computing and at a, at a, a hardware level uh, that are fault tolerant, essentially. Um, so, you know, besides that, we've been thinking of various dynamical ways of improving these Majorana qubits and this is a, an, an image that uh, was published recently in um, a, a journal from our group um, where we showed that basically if you have three Majoranas and you just have two of them doing their own dance uh, in a time dependent way, um, it turns out that uh, a third Majorana in fact automatically purifies and become, uh, becomes a much, much more isolated uh, excitation, which is what we want uh, from them. Uh, and so you can use this kind of a process to improve the quality of uh, the qubits that you already have in experiments. So I just like to thank again, uh, all these group members. Uh, we have a group that are full of excited um, yeah, undergrads, masters, PhD students. And if you want to know more of my, uh, of the research of our group, uh, please don't hesitate to write to, to me. Um, all right, uh, I'll, end, uh, I'll stop here. All right, thank you so much. Thanks. And uh, yeah, now we will uh, go to the last but not least, Lily, to present some of her research. All right, let's see if I can share my screen. And that's the last slide of this. There we go. All right, can everyone see it? Yes. Great. OK, so. Um, I, I also work with spin qubits, so like Bill does, but I work with a different type of spin qubit. I work with diamond, and in particular with diamond, where certain types of mistakes or defects in the diamond lattice are present. So here's one type of defect that we work with in my group, where two of the carbon atoms in the diamond lattice are replaced by a nitrogen and a missing carbon atom. So what happens when you make that kind of mistake uh, in a crystal? Well, one thing that can happen is that the crystal will change color. Uh, the electrons that are bound to these defects have characteristic excitation energies associated with specific colors of light. Um, and so this type of defect actually makes pink diamonds. In fact, all the different colors of diamonds are associated with different types of defects. But even more interestingly, the electrons bound to these defects have a net spin. Um, I've made this analogy to a little tiny bar magnet, um, because in fact it is a, a tiny magnetic moment. Um, and as I discussed earlier, this, this type of spin degree of freedom might one day serve as a quantum bit inside a future computing device based on the principles of quantum mechanics. Um, but one of the central challenges to realizing this is how to get the different spin qubits to interact with each other. They will interact directly, but only if they're really, really, really close. Um, and that makes it challenging to scale up. It would be awfully nice if you could have them interact over long distances. 
And one possibility is to use these optical transitions to send signals between different uh, spins associated with these defects. Um, in particular, thinking about using single photons to encode those signals. But how can you get a single photon to interact with a single spin? So for simplicity, you can think of this system a little like trying to get a single atom to, say, absorb an incoming photon with 100% probability. Well, how could you do that? You might try to focus the light down, get your best microscope objective to make the light more likely to interact with the atom as it passes. But you can only focus light so much to about one wavelength in diameter. And atomic cross sections are smaller that. In fact, smaller than that. And in fact, in this geometry, um, you can't get to 100% probability of interaction. You can do your best. You can get pretty good, but never to 100%. But if you can stick that atom inside an optical cavity formed by, say, two mirrors, such that when that light enters the cavity, it bounces back and forth for hundreds, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of times, then you can actually engineer close to deterministic interactions between a single photon and a single atom or defect center in diamond. And this is one of the problems that my lab is trying to solve. In our devices, we build these optical cavities uh, with one of the mirrors at the tip of an optical fiber. Um, here's an image of what that might look like. Uh, so if you've ever seen an optical fiber, it's just a little bit thicker than the diameter of a human hair. Um, this is a flat mirror. We can insert a diamond membrane in here that contains defect centers, and then we can assemble the system with translation stages, and vibration isolation, and lots of other details inside our cryostat. And, and we're working towards cooling the system down to be able to see our vision of a coherent interface between a single spin qubit and a single photon. We also have a few other interests, including using these optical microcavities to enhance absorption sensing capabilities, um, using defect spins as sensors of magnetic noise, and optimizing measurement strategies in quantum information and metrology applications. So, but those are stories for another time. Um, so I'll just end with a picture, a pre-pandemic picture of my group. Uh, the kids are now quite a bit older. Um, and I'll thank all, uh, acknowledge, of course, all my uh, collaborators. Uh, so that's that's it for me. Okay, perfect. And thank you again to all, all three of the professors for presenting their research and answering our first questions. Um, so now we're going to just move on to uh, open questions from the audience. And we do have one here. Um, and I think this is in reference to Bill's research, but I suppose anybody can answer it. Um, with four qubits, uh, what sort of types or categories of computing uh, can be done or what sort of theories can be explored? So uh, maybe I, I, I can take a quick stab at an answer, but if anyone else has anything to add, please add. Uh, so with four qubits, all you can do really is proof of principle experiments. Uh, there are no practical questions that you can solve with a quantum computer that you can't just simulate. So remember, uh, I said it would take all of the storage uh, in the world right now to fully describe the wave function of 70 qubits. Uh, but for four qubits, you don't need much memory. So you can actually store the state of the, of the wave function as we understand it theoretically in your computer and you can simulate what would happen. Uh, and so it's very efficient to, for four qubits to simulate that. But there's an exponential cost. Uh, in simulating what a quantum computer can do as you increase the number of qubits. And so as you approach that number 70, uh, you, you get to the point where it's absolutely impossible to describe all the things that a quantum computer could do. Uh, and at that stage, the quantum computer becomes very useful, potentially, for doing things that we cannot do now. Uh, we don't yet know all of those things yet, but you know we only know a, a small subset uh, of the things that would be useful. And Kartiak mentioned a few of them, like uh, factoring and sorting uh, lists. Hey, thank you. Um, and then we have another question here. So this is, I think, maybe more about quantum mechanics in general. And it says, uh, at what level of complexity or system size is the quantum state superposition principle lost? Or if we never lose this uh, quantum feature, at what level do we appear to lose it since 
uh, macroscopic in the macroscopic world, we don't perceive objects uh, being two places at once or in two states. Um, I'll start, but I'm sure Bill will have some insights to add, and probably Kartik as well. So this is this is a big problem: the quantum to classical transition, the the problem of decoherence. How do we go from this quantum mechanical coherent evolution to uh, what we experience? Um, and one one way to think about it is that uh, as as you get to larger and larger. Uh, objects, they, they're m much more strongly affected by their environments. Um, and as a result, these environments are kind of measuring the quantum states at all at, at as they evolve. And if you are continuously measuring something, you actually impact it. It's a little bit like Bill's dream analogy. As soon as, soon as you start describing your dream, you're going to affect the way you remember it. Uh, it's like this with quantum mechanics as well. When If you start off with a system in a superposition state and you measure it even just a little bit, you're going to affect that state. And so this continual process of the environment uh, measuring the, the objects that we see um, if effectively forces them to behave classically. Maybe Bill, you have some nuances to add there. Yeah, I mean, what, what Lily said is great. Uh, I, think, I think if I understood what Lily was saying, she's saying that we do have clear models that show this transition from quantum to classical as we build in more and more degrees of freedom in an environment that we don't know. So if we don't know about that environment, anything we don't know about it, its interaction with the system or its size or its state, that will lead to extra uncertainty in what the quantum system itself can do. Uh, and so that leads to uh, a transition from what I would describe as a superposition quantum state to a statistical mixture. So if you remember this distinction that I made early on between classical and quantum information. Um, it's interesting though, that the way the question was phrased, uh, I think was, is there an intrinsic size limit, right? Because the, we, we don't see quantum mechanics. I don't know how you would see it if you did. Uh, but is there an intrinsic size limit? And in- Wait a second, we're experimentalists. We do see quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you, you, you sorry. Yeah, yeah you, you see, yeah. I, I'm, a, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just teasing I, you a little bit though. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, of course. You see quantum mechanics all the time in the lab at the small scale. But the question is whether you could in principle never see quantum mechanics if the size scale got too large, right? And, and so far the answer is no. Uh, as far as people have pushed. Uh, in textbook quantum mechanics, from what you read, uh, the way it's laid out, the way the formalism is stuck in our minds from our undergraduate physics classes, the answer is no. It, as large as you make the system, it should be described by quantum mechanics. But not everyone believes that, or not everyone is, is sold on that idea because we haven't tested all possible sizes yet. And so there are ideas about how uh, quantum mechanics could collapse at some size scale. And there are very smart people who spend a lot of time thinking about tests that we can do on progressively more and more massive objects. So I, I, was, uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, an, an assistant uh, for uh, a lecture by uh, Tony Leggett, who is a, a, a Nobel laureate. He won his Nobel Prize for uh, uh, for superfluidity, but he's also made seminal contributions to this notion of decoherence, of destruction of, of information. Uh, and he, at least, it, you know, what he communicated to me and what he communicated in this lecture was that he was very skeptical that this idea that quantum mechanics should work at all size scales. And he was very, very interested in measures that would measure the deviation of, of our textbook quantum mechanics as systems get larger and larger. So it's a really important fundamental question that's still open, I think. And there are, to, to follow up on what Bill's saying, there are experiments that are trying to create superpositions of macroscopic objects. Um, experiments where, for example, they can levitate a small, it's a small particle, but it, you know, it's something that's big enough to see. It's not one atom, it's, it's I actually don't know how many, but probably millions, if not billions of atoms. Um, and they're, they're trying to levitate this and then make it such that this particle can be in two places 
things at once and look at how, how does that quantum state uh, decohere as you go to larger distances and larger objects, which would help to shed some light onto this problem. Um, so it's not just a philosophical question. It's also, as Bill was saying, something that people are devising tests to actually probe. All right, thank you very much. Honestly, I did not expect such a detailed and interesting answer to that question, but uh, I guess they call you experts for a reason. Um, we have another one here, and that is, uh, how does quantum entanglement factor into quantum computing? All right, Jake, do you want to try it, or should I try to... Well, that's that's. Um, I think I think the quantum information theorists should really go ahead. So I'll, I'll defer it to you, Bill. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, it's a tricky question, one way or the other. But <laughs> so I think I think um, uh, I think I think uh, as far as I know, uh, we we don't know of any quantum algorithm. I, I might be wrong here. I, I, I believe we don't know of a quantum algorithm that shows an advantage without entanglement. I know this was an important question in the field up until about five or six years ago. So it may have changed in the last five or six years if I missed something. Um, but I do not believe we know of any quantum advantage that we can get without entanglement. So the entanglement is uh, a li little bit more complicated than what I described. So I described something which is just a generalization of a superposition principle to many qubits. And that's a very rough way of saying it, but it's, it's more intrinsically related to correlations. Um, so you know that uh, <laughs> certain events are correlated. You're more likely to be wearing a hat if you go outside when the temperature is below measurements that cannot happen uh, from statistical mixtures and can only happen from superpositions of multi-particle states, okay? And then these correlations are believed to give rise to the distinction between quantum and classical behavior. There are other measures of distinctions other than entanglement. If you get into the weeds, uh, there is something called negativity, which is another measure of quantumness. Uh, and for some time, people were studying whether negativity could give you some kind of computational advantage as well. But as far as I know, and I could be wrong about this, as far as I know, no one has found uh, a clear advantage due to negativity without any entanglement. So the answer is this notion of entanglement does appear to be necessary for the examples that we know so far. Unless I could be mistaken, but I think that's true. All right, thank you very much for that response. I, I could add something that if you just have superposition, um, cl classical waves exhibit superposition. Uh, I can, you can imagine, you know, in a wave pool, uh, you excite some waves and you have a, a barrier and the wave can go on both sides of the barrier at the same time. And so it's in a superposed state and that, that doesn't lead to the same kind of advantage that we see with quantum algorithms. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have another question here. Um, could you comment on the performance of the Google quantum computer? Uh, is your work at McGill aimed principally towards building a quantum computer? I suppose we answered that with uh, your talks on research. And then um, sort of, can you define the difference between uh, any quantum research or quantum information research in industry versus academia? Yeah, maybe I could uh, say something about the first question. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, it was indeed a you know huge breakthrough two years ago or so when Google released their um, papers saying that they have attained uh, quantum supremacy. And this is the thing that I was talking about that you know the idea that there are certain problems that quantum computers could solve that they classical computers would just take an inordinate amount of time. Uh, to solve. And so, so Google uh, 
uh, programmed its computer to solve a particular task. And I don't need to go into the details of what that problem was, but important thing to say is that uh, their, um, their computer produced a solution uh, to this problem in what they said about 200 seconds. Um, and they also said that uh, in particular, uh, if the, the world's best uh, supercomputer could probably solve this problem in about 10,000 years. Now, um, right after that, there was a flurry of uh, tension and papers and a bunch of uh, theorists came out and said, well, um, actually, if you devise a clever enough classical algorithm, uh, the supercomputer would take just a day and, and they showed that in fact so um so you know despite all that being said i mean 200 seconds versus a day but essentially it's quite clear that we're progressing in the right direction and um so uh what what is basically now the factor that's limiting us is again this ability to make better qubits that are more isolated from the environment that you can implement logical operations on with a fidelity that's extremely high. And so there's work required to be done on Google side uh, and their team to improve the fidelity of their qubits. And then after that, the next step really, the step that would really, you know, I think be the next revolutionary step would be if they could then take this uh, quantum computer that they have and implement a quantum computer that could also do error correction. So, so far, the kind of quantum computer that Google has built cannot do error correction. Uh, although the chip that they have is, is, is laid out in a way that eventually they expect would be able to implement what is called the surface code, which is a, a, a quantum error correcting code. Um, but what, we are not there yet. I think uh, we're making important steps. And a lot of companies, uh, IBM, there's currently also a group in uh, China uh, that's built uh, 127 or maybe 200 qubits, something like this, uh, bit quantum computer that's also apparently um, solving certain tasks that are out of the reach of the classical world. Um, yeah. I can try to say something about the, the latter half of the question, contrasting industry versus academic research. And I think in a lot of cases, it's become a partnership um, because industry is plays a, an important role uh, in this idea of scaling up where there's a lot of engineering challenges that come into play. You can imagine if you've got 100 qubits, then you need to be able to address those qubits. You need to be able to control them. You need to interface it with a classical computer and be able to do all of this at uh, very low temperatures. And the, the sheer enormity of the engineering task makes it extremely well suited to the types of teams that industry can bring together. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of academic research pushing forward the materials, pushing forward new ideas for how to use these qubits, um, pushing forward some of the, the, the technology that's then going to be integrated into these highly engineered structures. Um, and so I think it's an important partnership that you know, industry can't always start, uh, can't always uh, afford to look at the high risk um, unlikely to work, but maybe very fruitful directions that academia can explore. Um, but they can bring together huge teams of engineers to try to tackle some of some of those challenges. Great. Thank you both for that response. We have a question here um, about topological qubits. Is the experimental realization of topological qubits uh, realistic? What are the main roadblocks to uh, achieve that? Yeah, so I mean, the well, it is certainly realistic. Um, so back already, you know, this this idea, this particular setup that I showed was proposed uh, theoretically uh, by a group of scientists from the University of Maryland, and um, uh, maybe in 2010, maybe in 2011. But I remember after a year, there was a paper out uh, in which experimentalists had claimed that they had already performed the experiment um, and, and seen this topological uh, qubit and signatures associated with it. Um, unfortunately, 
And it was not the fault of experimentalists, but as we realize as theorists, there's actually a number of different factors that could have produced the same experimental signatures. And so we were asking them to look at the wrong thing really. Uh, but that has continued and unfortunately to some extent. And, and as late as I think it was in 2020 that there was a, a sort of a mini scandal where um, the team um, uh, in the Netherlands produced this um, quantum computer, well, not quantum computer, sorry, uh, a Majorana qubit that, um, that, that supposedly again showed very, very clear signatures of uh, uh, behavior, but it was again falsified. So we're, so there is, okay, so let me, let me um, say that this is something that's developing. There's a lot of uh, theoretical and experimental interests. A lot of groups have observed things that are close to what we uh, think would be signatures of a topological qubit. Um, but to be honest, um, we have over time also come to realize that as theorists, that there are many, many things that could mimic these topological qubits. Um, so we need, in fact, better ways of being 100% certain that the topological qubits that the experimentalists have developed so far, how far are they from this topological qubit perfection? Uh, uh, are they somewhere halfway? It's not good to be, it's not good enough to be halfway there in some sense. Um, but that's, that's an ongoing question for the field, uh, both theoretically and experimentally. But as we speak, there's also new proposals, all sorts of new ideas to circumvent the material challenges. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully in the next, you know, four or five years, I, I really hope that we will see something uh, experimentally that can be classified as a topological qubit. Um, with, you know, specifically about your point on what are the challenges well, let me just give a small illustration of that. Well, the, 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 the point is that you want to build these wires um, on which on each end you realize a Majorana uh, uh, excitation. And the issue is that the Majorana excitations for them to be truly uh, working as a topological qubit, they must be kind of uh, thin. They cannot be fat and overlap. They have wave functions. Uh, and there's a certain probability of finding them or spread out uh, over the wire. And if, they, if these wave functions overlap, then we have a problem. Uh, and, and, and that's uh, basically the sticking point to make bigger wires turns out to be really hard. And if you want to try to make the Majoranas thinner, then we have to apply, uh, somehow get a better superconductor, larger magnetic fields. Both of those things are problematic because, uh, sorry, Get, get a better superconductor, but with a magnetic field, which is always trying to reduce superconductivity, it's very, very challenging. So there's some key material challenges that are making progress harder. And we're coming up with ways constantly um, to, to think of uh, improving on precisely that point, to, to find ways of building topological qubits using superconductivity, but without requiring magnetic fields. So again, hopefully in the next few years. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next question uh, is, is this, is the research of quantum uh, algorithms similar to the development of normal computer algorithms? So I, I don't think any of us can really say that we work on quantum algorithms. Maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess my group works on protocols, but they're not quantum algorithms in the same sense that a computer scientists would work on a quantum algorithm. Uh, but I do know a lot of computer scientists who work on quantum algorithms, so I can kind of speculate. <laughs> uh, so there are some very similar primitives. So there's this notion of complexity theory in uh, classical algorithms that Cartier already mentioned. Uh, and that uh, is, a, is a way of classifying all of the algorithms according to how long it would take to do a computation of a given size. And there is a very known, very well understood hierarchy in complexity theory, 
Uh, so, uh, so people know very, very well what classical algorithms are really hard, what classical algorithms are fairly easy, and which algorithms can be mapped onto which others. Um, for quantum algorithms, until relatively recently, that wasn't the case. Uh, so that area had to be reinvented, or and is still being reinvented. Uh, there are some notable people in the in the community that uh, work in this area of quantum complexity theory. So Scott Aronson, uh, who I think is now at uh, UT Austin, uh, is one person who works a lot in this area, um, and uh, there is a there is a, a known website called the Complexity Zoo, I think, or the uh, that that lists all the known quantum complexity classes, so all the different types of, of algorithms that can take different amounts of time. Uh, so that part of computer science or algorithm development had to be reinvented uh, and, and is somewhat different because we believe that certain quantum problems are harder than classical problems. Uh, but the actual design of quantum algorithms is similar in the sense that you take some primitives, some basic operations that you know how to perform, or some small subroutines, uh, and you pile them together, one on top of the other. And the way that people do that most of the time these days uh, is with the kinds of pictures that Lily showed that look a bit like musical notation. So where you've got a line for every qubit, and you join the lines with operations that you can perform on these qubits. Um, but more and more, uh, people have been developing quantum compilers uh, that know about uh, things like what we call the quantum Fourier transform, which involves many of these little primitives uh, and other types of algorithms that are like subroutines. Uh, and then you can actually write code the same way that you would write code for a normal computer. Uh, and there are, there are efforts to design uh, these quantum compilers uh, uh, that are being undertaken by a number of different companies. Uh, so Amazon has their own version. I know IBM has their own version. Uh, Microsoft has their own version. Uh, and then there's another version from, or, or a number of different flavors uh, from a company in Toronto. Um, uh, help me, Lily, which, what's the name of this company? Xanadu has, uh, Xanadu also has uh, a number of different quantum compilers that you can use now. So yeah, it's becoming more similar to regular computer science, but you still have to learn what subroutines are available because there are different things that you can do with a quantum computer. Okay, thanks so much, Bill. Uh, the next question is, what does a quantum logic gate look like? Uh, that one, that one is simple enough. I stand a shot at it. Um, so uh, there, of course, are many different types of logic gates. So you can have single uh, qubit gates, where, for example, the simplest one you might think of would be to flip uh, your quantum bit from zero to one. Um, but because this is a quantum state, if you're flipping your qubit, you. Uh, Bill had this picture of the block sphere, where you represent, say, zero is down and one is up. And so if I have a logical operation that's flipping you from down to up, it's also going to affect other states uh, in similar types of ways. So you can think of this as like rotating the block sphere to take you from down to up. Um, and so it would also be performing an operation on a superposition state as well. Um, so you can, you can define uh, effectively rotations uh, on the block sphere as uh, single, single qubit gates that are going to be taking you from one initial quantum state to another uh, state. And those are the, the simplest logical gates. And those are the ones that are easiestly, easiest to perform with high fidelity. That is, you know, they, they do exactly what you think that they're doing. Um, it becomes more difficult if you have multi-qubit gates. Uh, so a two-qubit gate, um, there's, there's many different varieties of them, um, but uh, one that is commonly employed as a, a, a universal two-qubit gate is the controlled knot, um, where, for example, I look at whether qubit A is up or down, and if it's up, then I flip qubit B. And if it's down, I do nothing. And so that's a controlled knot. Now, in practice, how do you realize these types of things? Well, that's, that's a tricky question that depends on the physical system that you're talking about. In the case of spin systems, um, gosh, I wonder if I could draw something. Hard to explain these things without. Well, let's say that I have 
um, a spin that uh, I can flip by sending in resonant microwaves, microwaves that are at the right frequency. And if that spin is near another spin that it interacts with, then the frequency of microwaves that I have to send in to flip it are going to depend on whether this spin is up or down. So if this spin is, is up, maybe my microwaves are resonant and they flip this spin. But if this spin is down, my microwaves aren't resonant anymore and it doesn't flip this spin. So that would be one way practically that you could implement uh, a logical gate. All right, thank you so much. Uh, our next question is maybe a little hypothetical. Um, is the brain a quantum computer? Can quantum information theory explain consciousness eventually? So I, I can't answer this personally, but I can say that it's not a crazy question uh, in the sense that there are other people who are working on it. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a very difficult question to answer, obviously. Uh, but there are some people who are taking concrete steps to ask it uh, whether there are quantum effects in biological systems or that are required for biological systems to function. Uh, so one person who's working in this area is Matthew Fisher at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and he has an interesting approach. He's actually working on some experiments on spin resonance that might indicate that quantum coherence can persist even at very high temperature environments or in very high temperature environments and for very long times. And if this is true, then it's possible that these quantum effects could be relevant in biological systems. So he's trying to find such things that might have these really, really long lived quantum coherences. Uh, they've been very difficult to see so far, but he's, he's, he's trying. Uh, another person who is working on this is uh, Brian Josephson. Uh, at Cambridge University, who is a former Nobel laureate uh, for an effect that named after him based on superconductivity, which is the central effect used in superconducting qubits. Um, but, but he has been working the last several years on understanding the role of quantum mechanics in consciousness. Personally, I don't, uh, I don't understand the work so well, uh, but, uh, but it is an interesting question. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I think this is going to be our last question. Um, it's a little bit of a fun one. So how far away are we from quantum video games? Kartik, I think that has to be for you. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm tagged as the gamer here. <laughs> uh, well, um, yeah, I mean, what would a quantum video game be like? Um, I don't know. That sounds uh, pretty fantastic, though. Um, if some, I mean, I'm certainly ready for game testing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know if this, this is related, but wasn't there a private company that was run by Misha Lukin and Dirk Eglund and? Uh... Uh, Marcus Greiner and a couple of other people that uh, actually made an array of, of qubits and then used fluorescence in these qubits to make uh, a kind of uh, like old style, 80s style video game. They, they made Mario and then they, I thought this, they is not, this is not, uh, I think the essence of the question, but I think just for fun, they showed that their qubit array could be used to, to show these nice 8-bit pictures. The video game characters. So in principle, you could use your quantum computer to play video games. Why not? It's, it's true, actually. If, if looking at what people do with their experiments uh, in their free time is any uh, indication, then as soon as we have a quantum computer, we're going to have some quantum computer games <laughs> with all the uh, grad students uh, programming in their spare time. But uh, yeah, who, who, who knows here? I can't wait. Um, and so with that, um, I want to thank our three panelists once again so much for this uh, very interesting uh, talk and for all their time that they put into this. And I want to thank the audience for attending. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. Um, I'll remind everybody that we have more live streams in the future, usually every month. And I can, I can tell you right now that the next one is going to be on February 15th. So keep your uh, eyes open on our social media or for any emails that we send you 
Um, and yeah, thank you very much. And of course, yes, uh, express your thanks in the chat on YouTube and uh, or Zoom, and we'll make sure that the, those messages get forward to our panelists. And with that, uh, thank you very much and good night. Thanks, good night.